when you do get to do edits yourself and then seeing something that you've edited on TV, it's, it's really exciting. So yeah, I do, I do genuinely love my job. <laughs> I do. And I, like, I quite like the, the craziness of it as well. Hi everyone, my name is Catherine and I work at Screen Skills. Welcome everyone to this online session, So You Want to Be an Assistant Editor. Today we're very lucky to be joined by Des Ivibuna. Des is a brilliant and up-and-coming editor with over eight years experience in the television industry. Having started in the industry as a runner, she has worked her way up to work on some of Britain's biggest series, including Disney Plus's series, The World According to Jeff Goldblum, Sky One's The Heist, Channel 4's The Island with Bear Grylls and Hunted. Des has a particular passion for comedy, observational documentaries and character driven stories that she can really get to the heart of. I will now hand you over to Kay, who is going to chair the session today. Welcome Kay and welcome Des. Um, yeah, well, welcome Des. Um, I've worked with Des on, we, did, we worked together on um, the heist for Sky One, which is a fact end series. Mm -hmm. And uh, Des is an absolutely brilliant, brilliant person to work with. Um, really creative, you know your stuff. So um, I know you're gonna give some good advice and tips today. So let's, should we, should we start off? Why don't you Des, why don't you just sort of start off by telling us what exactly does an assistant editor do? What, what is that role? So it's basically, as it says on the tin, you are an assistant to the editor. Um, we're the first people who get the rushes from the shoot and we have to organize them and get them into a project. So we have to set up projects in whichever um, editing software that you're using. If it's Avid, if it's Final Cut Pro, if it's Premiere, we set up the projects. We have to, you know, label them, get the footage in, um, in doing a process called digitizing and organize that. So it's basically like admin, but with video and make sure that the editors can access that easily so they can edit the program basically. We also do, we basically just have to be there for any kind of thing that the editor wants, if they need any help with a sequence, if they need us to look for certain shots, if they need us to look for certain sync, if they need us to look for a character, we're there to sort of know where everything is and be able to do it fast and efficiently. And um, yeah, that's basically it in a nutshell. And what, and what about, um, you know, you, you, do, you do this thing called conforming. Can you explain mm -hmm. a bit about what that means? Because I remember when I first went and edit and people say, oh yeah, that's got to be conformed. I'm like, what on earth does that mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, that's a stage of the edit before it goes off to broadcast. So when you're an edit assistant, you have all of these different stages. So the first stage is you've got to get the footage into the computer and that's called digitizing. And that's basically, if you imagine you're in a shoot, they're shooting so much footage and it's gonna take up a lot of space. So we have to digitize it at a lower resolution in the computer so that it saves space. The editor will then edit that footage at the low resolution. And once the edit's finished, they'll give us that sequence and we have to conform it. And that's basically relinking it back to the higher resolution footage. So that's what a conform is. I mean, I guess assistant editor, you're, you're on your way to, it's the sort of, building blocks isn't it before you become a sort of fully blown editor mm -hmm. but what why tell us a bit more about why that job is is so important at that assistant stage it's so important because you're dealing with if so much footage basically so a spe like speaking on programs that i've worked on which are you know quite big broadcast tv programs like the island with bear grills as you can imagine there are so many cameras running all the time there's so much footage and you have to be so organized so the people that are on the shoot they're shooting onto roles and there's got you know there'll be so many different roles and they'll be labeled with the day with the time with the character we get all of that footage and we have to you know translate that into the computer and we have to be so particular with it for example if we label something wrong a tape that we've gotten into the computer and an editor a couple of weeks later asks us for that role and it's wrong, they could get the completely wrong date and the completely wrong footage and that will hold up the production. That's just a small example of how a little mistake can hold up the production and why it's so important for us to be on top of things. We're basically, you know, there to get everything running as smoothly as possible. I suppose the thing is, because there's a massive difference between 
some of those shows that you just mentioned, like I know with, with Channel 4's Hunted, mm -hmm. um, the, the volume, there's, there's thousands of hours of footage mm -hmm. that needs to be ingested. Whereas if you're doing a more simple format, like, I don't know, Escape to the Country, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the amount of footage is gonna, be, is gonna be much reduced. So I guess you're only gonna work on something with such a huge volume of rushes when you're a bit, a bit more experienced. Absolutely, but um, even so, this, the same formula still applies. Even if it's a little shoot, you still have to be super organized and we're still that bridge. But um, yeah, you do have to be, I think what it will come down to is a bit more experience and have a bit more confidence to be able to deal with it because it can be overwhelming, even if you're really, really experienced, just seeing that volume of footage and knowing that you have you know, people that are asking you for this and that, and where's, you know, it's that thing where obviously confidence will come with a bit more experience. So that's why you'll have edit assistants that will be in it for quite a number of years, like myself. Before we go on to sort of a bit more about the actual job, tell us a bit, um, Des, about how you, how you started, what your background is, and how you actually got, in, got a foot in the door. So um, when I was at uni, I decided, I, you know, I enjoyed editing then. Um, basically, we had to make a documentary and um, no one wanted to do the editing and it was left to, to me to do it, so I did. And I just really enjoyed it. And so after that, I kind of made up my mind to pursue a career in editing. Um, when I left, I basically just looked up all of the production companies. Like at uni, they said, you know, it's the media industry is condensed in Soho, basically. That's where you're going to find all the TV um, post-production companies. So I just would go around with a CV, go into every place. Get, I, I, I literally just bombarded them. And it did take quite a while before I got a call back. And um, I started as a runner. So most people will start as a runner in a post-production facility or on a production, as um, you pointed out earlier, Kay. Um, but um, yeah, so that's basically, I started as a runner. After, yeah, yeah, after right. sort of like hounding lots of different post-production companies. <laughs> and, and yeah, I suppose, because it's important to, to, to say, isn't it? You, you, can either, you can either, starting off in, in, in editing, you're either going to work you're either going to be a runner and you'll be assigned to a production with a production company mm -hmm. or you're going to be in an actual post house where mm -hmm. all they do all day long is just editing and production companies might sort of outsource their editing to a particular post house. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so, and, and how did you know you wanted to go into editing? Like, what, what, why did you think, okay, this is when, when you were, sort of, what, what was your degree in? Uh, media, media culture and communication. So it was part practical and part theory and I was not interested in the theory to be honest with you. But um, yeah, so it was just an accident. Like I said before, um, we had to make a documentary and we got put in these groups and nobody was in every, you know, people were too keen to be the director or the camera person or the sound person and nobody wanted to touch editing. So it was an accident really. And um, my tutor just said oh you've got a really good eye for it and I just it literally was it just went from there and I just have stuck on that same career path ever since. And I wonder what they meant when they said you've got a good eye for it did they explain what they meant? Not I don't, I don't remember them saying that actually but it was we did a, um, a documentary on addiction in gambling and I think they just um, I think they just said being able to tell the story in quite a pretty way they I mean they didn't go into it I mean I can't remember it's so long ago <laughs> oh, no, no, it's okay. because I, I think that the, the great thing about the assistant editor role is that you you're, you're learning you're you're learning how the machine works and how the editing tools work and you get to edit bits little bits of shows don't you because on some of the big productions when it's mm -hmm. really busy um, like on on, on, on the high the helping out you get to cut your own scenes don't you yeah you do I mean that inevitably happens on on most of, I mean this is after I went from being an edit assistant in a post house to going freelance um, in my experience when you go freelance um, you have much more um, you're much more connected to the creative side of it because you know like you said you get so busy and the editors have, need to get on with something and they might need a story cutting that they don't have time to do and they'll give that to the assistant editor and that gives you you know a taste of um, you know, editing proper TV. And <laughs> um, I suppose what's great about that is that you get to you get to 
dip your toe in the water of it all, but, but ultimately the responsibility is not on your shoulders. Uh, you, you, yeah, that is, you know, that is a good point, but also actually, I wouldn't say the responsibility is, isn't on your shoulders. You do still have to deliver <laughs> and you have to deliver it quite, you know, quickly, but it's also good because you're not editing. Yeah. You, there's not as much responsibility as a senior editor. That's for sure. But, um, still has to, you know, be good. Don't, don't mess up. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, exactly. So Des, tell us a bit about, so what do you really love about your job? What's been the sort of um, most memorable or best experience that you've had as an assistant editor? Mm, so um, as an editor or an assistant editor, you're usually, you know, I, when I tell people about my job that I work in TV, they think it's quite glamorous and it's not glamorous, <laughs> you know, as an editor and edit, edit assistant you are um, usually just locked away and not locked away, but we're in a dark room basically just dealing with all of the rushes, you know, and sort of away from the glamour of, you know, I don't know. Filming on location or yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, every now and again, you do get asked to edit or edit assistant on, on a production. And I got asked to work on the Island with Bear Grylls and we all worked in Panama which was incredible. So it was definitely one of the most exciting things in my career. <laughs> and tell us, so what were you actually, why did you need to be in Panama? What, what were you doing in Panama? So um, as I mentioned earlier on, with that show, there are so many different cameras. You've got your um, embeds, which are two camera people who are on the island as well. And then you've got, you know, there's, you've got different teams and you've just got a lot of footage that, is running like basically 24 hours so if you know there's a shoot in the UK which is just filming for a few hours in a day this is like a number of different cameras constantly filming plus sound as well so we had to be there to make sure that we digitized the stuff and looked through the rushes and we're looking for stories and marking up um, in the rushes um, stories that the editor might miss later on down the line when they get the footage so we just had to be there to organize it before the footage got back to the UK so it was just that extra you know help that was needed yeah so you put you're putting you you oh, yeah they, they have GoPros going all the time the oh, that, really exactly time. GoPros yeah there was just a lot and um you know especially with um that kind of observational documentary kind of thing you know you can't always catch something on camera because you know they can't be everywhere at once but they always have their sound packs on so we need to listen to that see if there's anything that was missed and anything that you know we can speak about in future rushes on camera so yeah basically that that's good isn't it mm. a, cool, a cool thing to do oh, um, and then um tell us about so what are the to, to, to be an assistant editor what are the sort of key skills that you need sort of top tips really for anyone on how to be a great assistant editor um be really organized absolutely you have to be really organized it's so important i think that's the the first thing um have to be really observant have to know your project and your rushes inside out um be able to communicate you know because you you're the sort of person that all the editors are going to come to the producers will like everybody basically comes to you and ask you questions so you have to be able to communicate um and uh, yeah i think yeah that's kind of it really you just really want to do <laughs> and it's really it's so important as as tedious as it might be it's about being meticulous and diligent isn't it yeah absolutely um as i've mentioned before a tiny sort of um mistake at at the first stage of thinking can have a knock-on effect down the line you know so just kind of mistakes are going to happen you know it always does but you know just check things and double check them and triple check them always that's like the best advice that I had when I first got into it is just check and double check and triple check and never make any assumptions and ask for help if you need it oh absolutely definitely don't suffer in silence because people yeah. will want to help you. And it can be really daunting because especially when a production first starts and everybody's just trying to get into the flow of things and it can be really, really daunting at first, but um, you, you will get past that stage and 
just ask <laughs> people what always help yeah because i think i think sometimes people are so keen to sort of go on to the next the next bit and i want to i want to but i'm i've done all this i want to be an act i want to edit my own 60 minutes or whatever mm -hmm. but no one's going to give you that opportunity if you've not done the basic stuff really well well um, absolutely i think it's quite rare for someone to just leave uni and skip being a runner and skip working in the machine room and skip being an edit assistant it is quite rare and also you know as much as it would be nice to you know do that you ha having this kind of experience really is helpful because working in a facility knowing how for example if your computer if your avid you know or your whatever editing software you're using if it breaks down i've got the experience to know how to troubleshoot it and to sort out my own problems basically so these little technical skills, just learning the jargon and knowing how, you know, how to speak to all different departments. Um, it's really helpful. Sorry, can I just ask a quick question just on that? What is the usual kind of, uh, and I guess it's probably different with everybody, but the sort of typical timeline, I guess, of, of um, how, how long, for example, did you spend as a runner? And then how long did most editors spend assisting um, before their sort of, first editor um job she, that's a that's a good question and it really is different for everybody um but a, a rough amount of time i mean so me personally i wasn't a runner for very long i was a runner for six months um but i hassled you know people in the editing department and i got my face out there and i you know made sure that you know when a promotion came up to go into the machine room they thought about me and but for me i've sort of been in the assistant edit assistant for quite a long time Whereas I've got friends who, you know, I mean, I'd say between four and six years. So you can be an, you can be an assistant for a lot less, but, you know, just for going by the people that I know and myself, I'd say between three and six years. I guess it's different depending on what kind of the program it is, because if you're working on like a large volume. It, it's definitely program. circumstances as well, because I was in a post house for a number of years and um, I was going for promotions and finding that I wasn't getting them. And that's what made me make the decision to go freelance. Um, going freelance was good because I've done so much more editing. I got my first credits. So I think um, free, going freelance definitely makes your transition from assistant editor to editor a lot quicker than if you're in a post house. Yeah. Because if you're in a post house, you essentially, correct me if I'm wrong, Des, you're in the machine room, you're adjusting the rushes, you're marking up the rushes into sequences and stories and marking key bits of sync. Mm -hmm. You're not actually getting to cut any scenes, are you? Exactly. So when, when you're in a machine room, you're, it's very technical and you're, you know, like what it says on the tin, you're in a machine room, basically, and it's cold in there. You've got loads of machines, you've got your air con on. And you're really separate. From... Aircon air sounds good today. <laughs> like today, but not in, not in January, I'll tell you, it's, it's awful. And you have to have it on really cold all the time because the machines generate so much heat. Um, and you're just... Oh, on... I never knew that. Yeah, yeah. Basically, go in any, <laughs> go in any machine room um, and you'll be freezing within seconds. So we'd all be in there in our hoodies. But um, yeah, so and basically the phone is just going constantly in there. You're really separate from, you know, you're just basically on the end of the phone and you're getting stuff done and you, you're not uh, like right next to the editor in any sense. But when you work on a production, you have so much more contact with editors. So that's why it's a bit more creative. And what about sort of, we've talked a bit about, you know, what it takes to be good at the job. What are some of the sort of common fit, pitfalls people make being an assistant editor, you know, top tips, what you'd sort of wish you'd known at the start or uh, along the way? Oh, top tips. What It's just not checking. Like I said before, when you make the transition from runner to edit assistant, you can be in um, the machine room, like I said, and in that environment, I think there's a lot more, um, you know, opportunities to make mistakes there because like it's such an intense environment and you're doing so many different jobs. You're You've got to do conforms, you've got to do digitizing, you've got to do exports, you've got to do del deliverables, which is, you know, getting a program out to sent to execs, to directors. Like there are so many things and you have to be dead on with all of those things. You have to be really, really particular. And sometimes it's quite difficult because you're rushed off your feet, your feet, you do shift work as well. So some weeks you'll be doing night shifts, other weeks you'll be doing early morning shifts. 
So your shifts are changing all the time. So you have to be really prepared for that. And you just have to, no matter kind of if you're feeling tired or anything, or if it's so busy, you just have to make sure that you check things and double check them again and double check them because you could send out the wrong edit to somebody, which is a catastrophe. <laughs> you could, um, you know, there are, so, there, there are so many little things that go wrong. So if you just calm down, ask someone and check things, then that is just my biggest advice is just really check <laughs> whatever you've done. Because I guess if, if an editor has got, uh, you know, they're looking for, I don't know, some GVs of, of countryside mm -hmm. and the role number has been given, they've got one thing, but actually you've labelled it something different then they'll mm -hmm. end up finding, I don't know, something. To, you know, something. Yeah, so they're expecting a picture of the sea and they get a picture of a cat and you don't know where it is. So that's an example of how it can sort of, they'll be like, what is this? Why is it labeled as this, but I'm getting this. So you just have to be on top of it. Let's talk a bit about story because one part of an editor's job or assistant editor's job is knowing the, knowing the, the machinery and how it all works. Um, but what about sort of story? Um, how, interest, how, how sort of important is it being interested in story? Oh, it's, it's really important. And a thing that we get asked to do a lot is to do sync pools. And you can be, you, they can ask you to do all different kinds of sync pools. And sync pools is basically just going through um, the footage and picking out the bits where the subject is talking. So for example, if you have, if we're doing a documentary like The Heist or The Island and they might have missed a certain something, you know, that a subject says, you know, for example, a reaction and um, they don't have the reaction that they want, we need to like make sure that we can look through the footage and pick out different reactions and have a pull of that. So we've got it stored somewhere. So if anyone asks us, oh, do you have someone making a certain expression of anger or happiness or sadness or saying this or just saying something like, wow, or just like little things like that, those little things all add to a story. And just um, looking for good shots, obviously, you know, GVs like beautiful shots and things like that we need to look for those and what what are your top tips on sort of how to do how to do a good sync pulls someone once said to me if you're watching a load of footage if if you're glazing over while you're watching it get rid of it <laughs> and if it provokes a reaction in, within you either because you laugh or because you whatever you're, you're angry at it whatever then then keep it in um yeah, that's, that's, um, that's a good advice, actually. But even the bits that, I mean, because it can be quite, do you, do you know what, that's a really good point, because you can, you can, if you're, as assistants, we are just looking through so much footage sometimes, so it can be really easy just to glaze over anyway, and you might miss something. So I wouldn't personally say that, because I, I probably have, actually, it's a really good point about a mistake, is missing something by watching something kind of like just, you know, <laughs> as humans do, we can, you know, just be miles away, but you never know, even in those bits, there might be something useful. That's just me personally. And sort of on from that, you sort of touched on it, but sort of top tips on how to spot a story in a load of rushes. Ooh, how to spot the story. Um, that's a really good question. I, I, I suppose it's, um, it's knowing what it's knowing what's what 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 the character story is, isn't it? Anyway, and and knowing what's happened a bit before, maybe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, it's like you said. Yeah, it has to obviously anything that's engaging, anything that's relevant as well. You know, you you have a format for a show, so you have to look out for things that are relevant to that format. So there's no point in getting a load of stuff that you might think is okay, it has, to, it has to be able to tie into the story. It might be good, but it might not have anything to do with what we're trying to tell. So just make sure that you look for things that are useful, engaging and relevant. Um, before we sort of go on to some of the pre-prepared questions, um, I just want to take a question from Apsi, who's saying, have you ever faced any barriers as a woman of color? And if so, how have you overcome them? Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> yes, I have. And um, I, I think being um, a woman of colour in this industry anyway, um, 
to, to be perfectly honest, um, my competition is white middle class men, and um, they have they do have an advantage already. And I think that perhaps you know in the past when I was training people um, and you know guys that were you know my peers and I had actually trained them as edit assistants and I was going for promotions and three times they got promoted over me and on the third time I thought I'm not doing this anymore so that's when I went freelance and going freelance um, so that's how I sort of overcame came that I was in a post house before but going freelance I kind of felt that you know I, I felt more that I was valued a lot more now I don't know if I got um didn't get promoted over those guys but when it happened for the third time and two of them had actually trained myself it did it made me feel paranoid and you know there there's that whole thing with it's a difficult industry anyway but on top of that sometimes I think uh, did I get this because I'm black or and they want to fill up a quota or did I get this or, my, or didn't I get this because I don't fit the typical way that you know most of the people most of the editors in the UK look so I'm all I'm still battling with that myself to be honest with you and like I think uh, the um the conversations we're having at the moment is amazing it really is because you know there are we've got you know I'm in a group with um black editors at the moment so we're all sort of like talking and like you know it to have these conversations and stuff that us probably just squashed down for a lot of years but I think you know it's um it's a work in progress <laughs> it is and I would hope that in another x years editing suites don't look the way they do at the minute i.e predominantly middle class white mm -hmm. males um because it is a predominantly male dominated environment isn't it the in part of part of the industry yeah, yeah, it is definitely. Um, I'm so used to that now after like years of being in machine rooms and it's mainly guys and yeah, it's, it's massively male, do male dominated. But I guess your advice is to just, just keep on persevering to anybody, you know. Speak about it, talk about it. I think probably mistakes that I've made in the years is sort of like not vocalising and, and to be perfectly honest, not being that stereotypical person I've, to I've toned myself down I have toned myself down in the past and that's why I'm glad that these conversations are being had now so for the younger generation like be who you are and still go for it like definitely you know people are listening now so go for it yeah Erica says as a black woman in this industry I totally get it thanks for being honest no way I hope not either it's 2020 yeah thank you brilliant advice and really nice comments Oh yeah, could I just go back to one thing? Because I noticed when you were talking about um, story and listening to the rushes, and actually somebody's asked if you could repeat the bit um, that you were talking about. I think it was the island when you were talking about um, having to like listen to everything because although they haven't, they won't always be filmed. They'll always have, they'll always be um, recorded. I think that's what um, Shamara means. Um, but could, I think um, could you just explain that again? That that um, mm. that side so of it. So basically they have audio, I mean, you've probably seen when you're watching, when you're watching TV, you know, like any reality show, basically, Love Island, whatever, they've always got these little audio packs on. So um, they're co constantly recording. So it's something that's called OOV. So you'll be asked to listen for anything OOV, which is out of vision, which, you know, the camera's, you know, not picked up. So it might be, for example, I mean, it sounds really intrusive and it really is when I'm saying it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, when, you know, for example, if there's, you know, two people having an argument, it's not caught on camera where they're having a discussion and it's really relevant to the topic. Like, for example, on the island, it was, the topic was rich versus poor. So you want to listen to any conversations on either side that might, that the camera might have missed that will be relevant to the, to the subject. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the contributors know, don't they? They're wearing a mic pack. They know it's recording all the time and they've sort of agreed to that. So yes, I know it just sounds weird, doesn't it? Listen, listen, just listening to what they're saying without it being filmed, but, but they yeah, know. That they recording. know, exactly. And also, you know, it's, uh, anything that is not relevant to the show is not going to be used, you know? Any, I mean, anything personal or anything that's not like that, but um, yeah, it's just anything that's relevant to the show and stuff like that. 
give us give us a sense of what's been your sort of um your biggest sort of near disaster as an assistant editor have you had any mo really sort of hairy moments where you've messed up um probably like doing a conform so that you know is when i'm working at a post house and we have to work like i mentioned before we do overnight shifts and when you're on an overnight shift obviously there's only you and a few other assistants there so in the daytime you can ask someone senior for help or you can ask for a little bit more time but when you're working an overnight shift you've got the massive amount of work to do and you've got to get it ready by the morning in most cases so that they can carry on with it with it the next day and um there was one time that i did a conform so i was relinking the um high quality footage to a sequence and i had to get it ready to go to the colorist by the morning and I did this conform really 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 well and I was just like so happy with it and I did an export of this sequence to send off to the um, colorist and when I did the export I put burnt in time code on it so I basically put numbers burnt into the cup and sent that off to him and he had to grade it for a certain time and I went home I went to bed and my phone started ringing I was like oh my god <laughs> They were not happy with me, <laughs> so, but yeah, it was a rookie mistake. Because <laughs> you would have a time code on when when you when you before you, you send off the the final cut, wouldn't you? Just so that when people are viewing it, they can mm -hmm. and they've got changes to make, they can reference the time code at certain points. But yeah, exactly. you don't want the burnt in time code with the final on the final. You don't want. <laughs> so, yeah. But then I always think, you know, with mistakes, you definitely would never, never, ever do that again. Never. And that's just down to, you know, you're always, you're going to make a mistake, you know, and, um, and it's, uh, it, even though people might be mad at the time, it's not the end of the world, you know, they could just, all they had to do was do another export, but <laughs> it's, it felt like the end of the world at the time. It, I felt sick. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Des, you've given us, like, you've told us, you know, you can work in a room, it's dark, it's cold, it's hard as industry to get into, you can do night shifts, oh my God, things go wrong. It sounds quite horrendous. What do you love about the job though? What's so great about it and why do you persevere? I, I do love the job and I'm not just saying that, I do really genuinely love it. Um, you, you know, obviously there are so many different TV shows all the t happening all the time. So no two jobs are the same. There's always a new subject matter. There's always a new way of doing things. I feel like I'm kept on my toes all the time, which I like. I don't like being bored. You know, you've always got new things to learn, especially when you go freelance, you're meeting a new crew all the time, new people. Um, it's exciting, to be honest, and it's creative. And especially when, you know, even when you're an assistant and you're not necessarily doing the editing, you're still part of the, cre the creative process because you're helping the editor with shots. They ask you for things. They're like, you know, can you help me find this shot? You know, it, it can, have you spotted anything that's useful so you are part of it? And also like when you do get to do edits yourself and then seeing something that you've edited on TV, it's, it's really exciting. So yeah, I do, I do genuinely love my job. <laughs> I do. And I, like, I quite like the, the craziness of it as well. Um, someone just asking, do you ever um, choose or cut temp music for the editor? We had a seminar with an editor earlier this week. She said it was sometimes tricky to handle to find the right music uh, yeah yeah definitely um so just using the world according to jeff goldblum as an example um the music for that like i actually searched for a lot of music for the editors and it was temporary music until they because they got a composer i believe to do stuff for them so there can be times when you're editing something and you do use a placeholder for music and you just go to like oh god what can i think of what sites do you go to I don't know you have library music and you have sites that you go to and they you know you just search for a genre of music and you play about with it until you find the right thing so sometimes you can have a sequence and you use a placeholder music but it has like the vibe that you're going for and then they will go for a, get something composed or you know that, that was so a bit waffly <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's good. So you go into something like Audio Networks is a big one, isn't it? Yeah, that's Audio really... Networks and, and then there's, oh God, what else? There are a couple of others and I can't think of them. We've got Universal, you've got, you know, there's a few different, a few different sites that you can go to. And how, so how, how do you go about getting the right music? You just input the sort of, I'm looking for romantic, slow, how does it work? 
yeah exactly so um you, you obviously need to know what vibe you're going for first so like with Jeff Goldblum it was all very jazz oriented they wanted it to be you know it's like so cool and like you <laughs> like that so you know and then you can work on something where there'll be drone shots so you look for music that's epic like you know and it just all depends really on what the director is going for. We had an, um, an editor did a, a sort of more a, a, a craft session a couple of months ago and he was saying that the audience always you need to sort of take them by the hand and mm -hmm. tell them how they're meant to be feeling with music. Oh, so that's really to be good. feeling sad, play. I mean, it seems really obvious, but it's yeah. true, isn't it? If they're meant to be feeling like excited by something. You need to give yeah. that. Sort of... It's really tricky to do as well. You know, some people are really talented at finding the right music. You know, and I think that's something that comes with experience. I know when I <laughs> first like. I edited something and I used some wacky music and like, <laughs> was it you actually, Kay? Was it? I don't know. <laughs> no, who? I know it might not have been you, no, but I know, but they were just like, are you all right? <laughs> yeah. It must it have been in a like, mood that day. Yeah, it must have been. I don't know. But yeah, sometimes, you know, it is, um, it's something that comes with time, like judging the right music. And I know when you, when you do get the right music, it's a buzz. It sets the whole tone. You could play the same scene with lots of different music and it could mean lots, you can interpret it in many, many different ways. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I had a question. I know, I don't know if you said this at, at the beginning, um, Des, but I know you talked about conforming, but you've also talk, talked about um, di digitalizing. Digitizing, like, yeah. In really simple terms, what, how do you do that? And what, and what exactly is that? Um, digitizing so that's um, getting all the footage from the shoot into the machine basically and you do that by um, it just depends on I mean on what format it comes in it will, can come in on drives so if it comes in and on a drive and you've got rolls um, they've been backed up from you know from the camera and you get those into the computer and you transcode them so when you get all of these files you make a bin and you've got all of your camera files in this bin and you select them and you'll have options to transcode them and then you transcode them to whichever resolution which usually will transcode them to a low resolution which makes the files so much smaller and they can be stored in a computer in a facility because you've got so much you don't want big files they're going to crash the computer so you just mm -hmm. keep all of that volume of footage at very low resolution Mm. And, and Des, what, what advice have you got for people to improve their editing skills? You know, if they are already an assistant editor, should they be asking, asking editors if they can cut stuff or yeah, uh, should they be shooting, cutting stuff at home? What, 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 what are your sort of top tips on that? Um, definitely ask editors if to cut stuff. You know, I think that's been the best sort of me improving as an editor has definitely been being around other editors and them ask, asking me to do something and editors will always give you feedback and generally be quite honest about it so I think um, you know if you have the time then do things at home absolutely and I think that you know now every, you, everything you do is editing with social media with TikToks, like anything like that. You're always telling a story. So just translate telling a story to, you know, a bigger thing like like TV. Translate that kind of storytelling, like what looks good and stuff like that and putting music to something. You can keep, you know, just you can practice it really basically. And um, Danny's asking, should an editor have a show reel? And if so, how long? I find it difficult because if you edit it into a montage, you're essentially presenting an edit of an edit. So I thought it would be better to have a longer showreel and just play a few long excerpts from some of your work. What, what do you think? Oh, that's, a, I mean, I don't have a showreel and I should do, and I've been saying it for years. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. I think it's just your personal preference, to be honest with you. Um, if you, I mean, I think it, I, I would personally do it short, shorter and you know more sharp and buzzy and do the edit to an edit like you said I think that's a bit more engaging. I suppose because in sort of unscripted TV the world that you work in it's very much you get getting jobs well how do you get jobs you, t you, you tell you tell. 
Um, so, well, I'm within agency, so I get jobs through them, but also I get jobs um, from people that I've worked with in the past and they will ask me to do stuff sometimes. So it's, uh, so it's half like through word of mouth and half, well, pretty, yeah, half through my agency. How does that work? At what point would you get an agent? How would you go about doing that? Um, so, yeah, when I just made the decision to go freelance, I just searched for agencies basically and just applied to I mean I applied to a few and I got rejected from loads and then the one that I'm with now I've been with for years and yeah just literally just tell them a bit about yourself and you you need to have um a, a bit of experience well you know you need to be able to you need to be competent enough to go on your own they're sending you out obviously you don't, they don't want to send someone out that just is going to fall apart and can't do the job so you need um yeah you need to know what you're doing so that might mean my advice is always to if you're going the route that i did which is working in a post house first you start as a runner get yourself into the machine room that's the the, the tough job i won't lie is when you're doing shift works and it's really shift work and it's really busy but you're learning so much so many technical skills so get all of that knowledge when you're there get all of that um avid media composer premiere final cut pro just absorb all of that knowledge until you are so good at it that you know what you're doing and you feel com comfortable and then go freelance and you know you, you not everybody has an agent you know i'm yeah i i know of out of all of my friends that i know I think i'm probably the only one but you know a few people do but it's not not everybody has one so you can go it alone but make sure that you're um making connections and talking to people and stuff like that it feels like the editing role is one of the most highly skilled in all of certainly in unscripted tv because not only have you got to totally be able to use the average really quickly and know all the shortcuts and know what you're doing there and that's one part of it but the other big part when you're doing you know big 60 minutes even 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 shorter programs mm. is how to tell a story isn't it absolutely yeah you know because i think maybe some some sort of more junior people fall foul of the fact that they're really whizzy on the keys. Mm. But actually, when it comes to, we've got all these rushes here, how on earth are we going to tell this story? I guess that's something that comes with experience over time, isn't it? It does. And that's a really good point because um, actually I felt when, because um, I, when I just left uni and I'm full of all, the, all these creative ideas and whatever, whatever, and then I work as a runner and then I'm in the machine room, which as we said before, you're, separate from being creative you're sort of doing technical stuff and then when I went freelance and then was like you know I really want to edit I lost a lot of confidence because there was like those years when I was doing technical stuff so I felt like I just went from creative to technical and then I had to get that confidence back and like know how to um you know do do those things basically to be able to compete with um editors that have been doing it for years What's one thing you know now that you would do differently if you're at the start of your career? What's a hard question? Oh, no, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, I, I know, I think I would, what would I do differently? I would get out of the machine, machine room as quickly as possible. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah, Cause, and, and, and apart from improving your editing software skills, how do you best prepare yourself to access your first internship or entry role? When I was at uni, they didn't even teach us AVID or anything like that. So I didn't know AVID. I literally learned it on the job. So I think you have to be prepared to be out of your comfort zone and maybe do um, a job that is making tea and like a job that has nothing to do with editing for a bit, but be in that environment, just be prepared for that. Do you use different software depending on which project you're working on, which company you're working at? And if so, which editing software would you say is used the most in the industry, Avid or Premiere or Final Cut? Um, in my experience, Avid Media Composer is the, the main one. But um, I do get a lot of jobs offered to me through my agency that's using Premiere. Um, and I don't know how to use it like in an editing sense. I can do basic things on it, but I don't know how to use it in an editing sense. So... Um, I turn those jobs down. Final Cut Pro, not as much as before. Um, I think they brought out a newer version that was really basic and it's kind of, I don't see Final Cut Pro being used in most broadcast facilities very much anymore. 
So I'd definitely say Avid Media Composer and Premiere. Um, someone's asked, have you ever done VFX editing or assisting? If not, would you like to? Um, I haven't and um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. it would be really cool but um I've got enough on my plate with learning what I'm yeah. doing at the moment so it's a completely different career so but um it's cool man like it's definitely like uh, it would be a really cool thing to do so someone sent me a message probably saying maybe people looking for ideas for show reels you could search on other you know editors websites to get ideas and inspiration that's a really good tip actually to see what other to see what other editors have actually done and what they what they send out there. I suppose once you get to a certain stage, mm. you you rely on word of mouth and connections, and you've made all those or you've made a lot of connections in the industry, so you don't need a show in the same way, do you? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that's true. You know, I, I I very rarely get asked asked for one in um, a bro like broadcast TV sense. Whenever I get asked for one, it's usually. Um, people who have done music videos or something like that, something that I don't do very often in, you know, or short little promos. It's people like that that ask me for a showreel, but not, I've never been asked, asked for one at any, you know, a TV job, like working with UK or any other one. I've never been, I haven't yet. <laughs> so, but I should do one. I should. Um, somebody's asked um, that although you mentioned about, um, getting out of the machine room ASAP, um, would, you, would you still recommend it for the experience for would-be editors, assistant editors? I'm, I'm guessing yes. But. Absolutely. I, I know that that's, I mean, um, that's just me personally. That's my own journey um, that I, you know, I, 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 I spent too long at a facility and I didn't um, um, progress in the time that I wanted to. So that was my personal thing. You know, it can be different for anybody. I mean, you can do different paths from the machine room as well. You can go into engineering, you can go into onlining, you can go into grading. There are so many different things. For me personally, that's, that's it. And it, you know, yeah. Because mm. okay, I suppose, and as well, sort of when you're starting out, I guess you're gonna, you're gonna take really whatever experience you can get. And maybe are there more, when you're starting out, are there more roles Rather than working broadcast TV, there's maybe all film. Maybe there's more roles in doing like little ad agency things or those sort of little promo things. Um, it... When you when you leave uni, as in not going straight into broadcast. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying yeah, I... that people can sort of um, in, in improve their skills, but but it may be before they then go into broadcast or film. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like as in. Uh, like editing skills you mean like improving their editing yeah, skills. yeah yeah I mean you I don't know if it's like this anymore but when I first left uni um I was applying for loads of different places and you know that that's one other thing about this which you know it some people might ask you to do a lot of free work and I know when you're at that age and you're like at you you, you know you, you you can't you know you can't really afford to do a lot of free work as well but there is that there are those things and you know if you can then you can you know uh, like practice your skills and maybe doing a few little free jobs free editing jobs or whatever uh, and and what about can you just talk a little bit someone's asking about the you know you're working with an agency how does it work do they have any sort of exclusivity contract with you or is it just commission based and you use them like a recruitment agency and they, they take a percentage of your, of your salary. Yeah. So some, um, agencies, they are fine with you being with other agencies, but the one that I'm with, they, if you're with them, you have to be with only them. And, um, they take 12.5% of whatever I make. And I've been with another agency before and they, you have to pay them a monthly fee. So this one that I'm with now, you know, cause I left them briefly and tried another agency, but I've gone back to them. 12.5% is really reasonable for what they do. They've got me some really good gigs. They've known me for a long time. It sort of feels like family a little bit and um, they progress your career in a certain way. You know, say that I, I like comedy, for example. So they got me on the League of Gentlemen. And um, so, yeah, it's, um, it's, def it's worth it. It's worth the 12.5%. And do you still have to pay that if, if you don't get a job through them and someone offers you a job? No. No, so the I can, like I said, I can do word of mouth jobs and, but any client that they've introduced me to, I can't, you know, go, 
you know, if they approach me for work, I have to tell my agency, like, but if it's a client they haven't introduced me to, I don't have to give them 12.5%. Can you give an example of any films or TV shows that you've thought that have maybe inspired you or that, that people maybe should watch to look for good editing things or inspiration or... Um, it's really hard on the spot, isn't it? When someone yeah, has it's quite hard. I mean, because it, it changes all the time. I'm into so many different things. I mean, okay, I'll, I'll just go by something that I've recently, because, I, you know, if I talk about stuff that got me interested when I was in uni, it's so old. I don't want to embarrass myself. <laughs> but I'll just talk about um, something that I worked on last year, like with the editors, because I was an assistant editor in The World According to Jeff Goldblum, but there were some amazing editors on there. Just if, oh, but then again, it's Disney Plus, you need a... Um, uh, a, what's it called? A subscription. Oh, what can I think? Um, God, what have I, what re really impressed me recently? I, I mean, the, the, I guess what I've seen a lot of in sort of fact end and documentaries is that editors will often pull, they'll, they'll, they'll cut a sequence in a way that they've, they've pulled, you know, they've got their inspiration from, you know, Chernobyl or some great big That's, that's a, exactly, yeah, that's the one that I love. I mean, definitely looks that, but there was something recently and I wish I'd written it down before that I, I was so impressive and I can't think of the name of it. And I'm sorry, it's just completely no gone. I can never come up with the names of things <laughs> on the spot, but yeah, I can't think of anything at the moment, sorry. <laughs> I guess it's just watching watching and absorbing everything and, and steal, not stealing and taking little ideas. Inspiration. To yeah. yeah, exactly, inspiration. Getting inspiration from things. I, mean, um, I think one, someone that we had on earlier in the week had said that from the audience's um, point of view, the best, the best edited programs, the audience wouldn't even comment on the editing because it's like a sort of, they, it, they didn't even think about the fact that it's been, it's been edited to even acknowledge yeah. it. But I guess watching it from somebody who is an editor or somebody that works in TV, you, you know, you sort of watch it with a slightly different eye, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, there is that thing. Um, but I, uh, yeah, like you said, I notice uh, when they've gone for a certain style and I'm like, oh my God, that's so cool. <laughs> but um, what is, uh, yeah, Baby Driver's quite good for editing. That's, that's a good film. Baby, I, that Baby Drive. Me. Baby Driver is Baby a really Driver. well editing. Yeah, it's a really well edited film. It's cool. that, that nine was it 1917 the Sam Mendes film I was watching that because it was all meant to be done on one continuous shot mm. obviously the whole thing wasn't but I was constantly looking for the cuts and I couldn't there were just lots of sort of wipes and things where uh, but it's so cleverly done now, Christopher asks um I know you mentioned about using editing software but do you know if people use DaVinci Resolve for editing as it's something I've been learning myself to use during my internship it's a piece of software that's free to use as I've been working from home during the pandemic. And that's awesome to, 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 to learn how to use that because they do use that in post facilities, but they use it for grading. That's the only um, like um, experience I've had with it is, as a, um, a coloring, you know, a colorist. So that's the only, I haven't used it very often, but I have used it to, as, you know, to using it for, to change formats of files and stuff like that is a really useful thing to know. So it's good to know that. Um, and they do use it in post houses, sorry. <laughs> we, we, we're pretty much out of time. Um, um, any final tips for people looking, who are graduating now and looking for their first job in editing? Um, so if, if it's anything like my experience and it did take a long time to get my foot in the door, um, obviously you need to provide for yourself financially so just do a job that is temping maybe so that is something that you can leave quickly enough if you do get that offer to work in a production company um yes just um and look after yourself and you know it can be really daunting and it can be really fast paced so don't forget to look after yourself and you know self-care and everything it's honestly because I, I didn't I was you know I definitely got quite overwhelmed at the, at the beginning and you really want to prove yourself and you want to do all of these things but you can do them but just remember you know to look after yourself as well yeah that's so important oh yeah obviously it's so important does 
to you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. There's so many no comments coming through. Good thank you. Someone said, thank you for reminding me how good work in TV... Pearl says, thank you for reminding me how good in t work in TV can be if you get it right. I lost my confidence. I left after my confidence took a beating. Maybe one day oh. I'll return. I, I really understand what it is to lose your confidence. So I, I definitely like go back to it. Definitely. I, there are people that if you're honest as well, you'll sometimes realize that somebody has been through the same thing or feels the same way as you. So definitely talk. Definitely. And I, I feel like most places that we work are actually really lovely and full of supportive people and don't mm -hmm. be put off by the odd place you may work at where you work with somebody that either you don't get on with or who's a pain to work with yeah because uh, most most people in, in in the tv industry are absolutely lovely aren't they uh, definitely that's that is true you know like anywhere you'll get your bad um apples but you know most people are supportive you, you realise that when you start to talk to people. So, yeah, definitely. Um, well, Des, thank you so much. That was a fabulous, insightful session. Um, chock full of sort of top tips and advice. So um, I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, until the next session, everyone, have a great weekend. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.